It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. For today's episode of Comparative Mythology, we're going to compare and contrast elements of the Odyssey with the shipwreck to the Book of Acts. Now, when it comes down to dating, we do know that the Odyssey was written down roughly around the 7th or 8th century, and the Book of Acts was also written down roughly around the 70 CE, give or take, and so the Book of Acts came much more later in comparison to the Odyssey. Now, before we start the comparison, I think it's very important to you know, know a Christian perspective about this particular idea, largely because most of the ideas that I have been doing is largely from a non-Christian perspective. And so let's see a Christian perspective about the issue about the Book of Acts versus the Odyssey. Now the following ideas that I'm going to say out loud comes directly from a French Protestant church. In my opinion, there are several reasons, each full of wisdom applicable to our own lives. These reasons also provide us with some ideas about how we can approach our readings of the writings of Luke. Before we consider these reasons though, we must understand a bit of context of this text. Luke is a Greek doctor who is knowledgeable of Greek literature, although in ancient culture, it wasn't even necessary to particularly cultivate it to know the Iliad and the Odyssey of Homer, which date from the early 8th century BC, so this literary multiment, which is the Odyssey, could have been known to all Greek speakers, and thus particular, people like Luke is addressing through his writings. There could have been known passages from the Odyssey by heart, and therefore everybody encountering Luke's text would immediately understood that this final episode in the Adventures of Paul is an allusion to one of the major events of the life of Odysseus described in the Odyssey. Paul and Odysseus both swim to their islands while holding pieces of wood. The inhabitants of both islands are presented as leaving peacefully. Both Odysseus and Paul are mistaken for gods. Both Odysseus and Paul are treated with the highest honor by the most important person in their respective islands. Both Odysseus and Paul receive luxurious gifts upon their departure something that aids them greatly in the continuing journeys. Following these events, both Odysseus and Paul arrive eventually at their destinations. Why would Luke do this? In this final episode of his book, Luke gives the key of the interpretation of his text. Luke invites us by making Paul into a new Odysseus to read the journeys of Paul in the same way that the ancient Greeks read the Odyssey which is to say, an allegory of our own existence. Luke was a close companion and friend of Paul, thus he speaks of a person who is real and concrete for him. His description of the voyage of Paul, and could therefore pass as historical accounts, especially those that are recall in the first person. We can read the text like this, of course, but Luke advised us to consider the text in a different way. In the end, he tells us that this allusion to the Odyssey the aim of writing is not to speak about you as about Paul as such, even as he was a friend, but writers drew him to invite you to live more frequently. Luke show us that his turning towards God does not imply his turning away from the world and not from a culture. We can read the Bible and list Christians while reading novels and philosophy, listening to rock or classical music, studying Zen Buddhism, etc. And all these things we can find resources to nourish our reflection, our sensibility, and even our faith. Again, I want to further remind you guys that this is not necessarily me saying this. These are Christians themselves that I actually acknowledge this. When it comes down to the idea of mimesis criticism, there's no denying that many famous philosophers during their time period actually acknowledge the existence of this. For example, some quotations include who claimed that the writings of Poe's is not reliant of the Hometic poems? Another one says right here, For in everything we teach examples are more efficient than even the rules which are taught in schools, so as long as the students have reached a stage where they can appreciate such examples without the assistance of a teacher and can rely on its own power to imitate them. 
There is no doubt in art a small portion of our life lies in imitation, since although invention came first and is all important, it is assembling to imitate whatever then invented with success, and it's a universal rule of life that we should wish to copy what we approve on others. It is for these reasons that boys copy the shape of the letters that they may learn to write, and that the musicians take the notes of their teachers, painters, the works of their predecessors, and peasants, the principles of agriculture, which has been proven in practice as models for their imitation. In fact, we may note that the elementary study of each branch of learning is directed by reference by some definite standard that is placed above the, the learner. So, without further hesitation, let's compare the two stories and see how similar they are. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health, for there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of them all, and when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. And we were in all in the ship two hundred threescore and sixteen souls. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. And when it was day, they knew not the land. But they discovered a certain creek with a shore, into the which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust in the ship. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea, and loosed the rudder bands, and hoised up the mainsail to the wind, and made toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the forepart stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land, and the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. Chapter 28. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. Gladly then did noble Odysseus spread his sail to the breeze, and he sat and guided his raft skillfully with the steering oar, nor did sleep fall upon his eyelids as he watched the Pleiades and the late-setting Bootes and the bear, which men call also the wane, which ever circles where it is and watches Orion, and alone has no part in the baths of ocean. For this star, Calypso, the beautiful goddess, had bidden him to keep on the left hand as he sailed over the sea. For seventeen days, then, he sailed over the sea, and on the eighteenth appeared the shadowy mountains of the land of the Fiacians, where it lay nearest to him, and it looked like a shield in the misty sea. But the lordly earth-shaker, as he came back from the Ethiopians, beheld him from afar, from the mountains of the Salimi. For he came into his sight, sailing over the sea. And he became the more angry in spirit, and shook his head, and thus he spoke to his own heart. Out on it! The gods have certainly changed their purpose regarding Odysseus while I was among the Ethiopians. Here he is, near to the land of the Phaeacians, where it is his fate to escape the trial of misery which has come upon him. Nevertheless, even yet, I think I shall give him his fill of evil. So saying... He gathered the clouds, and seizing his trident in his hands, troubled the sea, and roused all blasts of every sort of wind, and hid with clouds land and sea alike. And down from heaven night came rushing. Together the east wind and the south wind dashed, and the fierce blowing west wind and the north wind, born in the bright heaven, rolling before him a great wave. 
Then were the knees of Odysseus loosened, and the heart within him melted, and deeply shaken he spoke to his own great-hearted spirit. Ah, me, wretch that I am! What in the end will befall me? I fear that all the goddess said was true when she declared that on the sea, before I came to my native land, I should fill up my measure of woes. Now all this is being brought to pass. Such are the clouds with which Zeus overcasts the broad heaven, and so has he stirred up the sea, and the blasts of every kind of wind sweep upon me. Now is my utter destruction sure. Thrice blessed those Danaeans, and four times blessed who perished in those days in the wide land of Troy, doing the pleasure of the sons of Atreus. Would that like them I too had died and met my fate on that day when the throngs of the Trojans hurled upon me bronze-tipped spears fighting around the body of the dead son of Peleus. Then should I have got funeral rites and the Achaeans would have spread my fame. But now it is by a miserable death that it was my fate to be cut off. Even as he was saying this, the great waves struck him from above, rushing upon him with terrible force, and spun his raft in a circle. Far from the raft he fell, and let fall the steering oar from his hand. His mast was broken in the middle by the fierce blast of tumultuous winds that came upon it, and far in the sea sail and yard arm fell. As for him... For long the wave held him under, nor could he rise at once from beneath the onrush of the great wave, for the garments which beautiful Calypso had given him weighed him down. At length, however, he came up and spat forth from his mouth the bitter brine which flowed in streams from his head. Yet even so he did not forget his raft, in distress though he was, but lunged after it amid the waves, and laid hold of it, and sat down in the middle of it, seeking to escape the doom of death. And the great seas bore the raft this way and that along their course. As when in autumn the north wind bears the thistle tufts over the plain, and close they cling to one another, so did the winds bear the raft this way and that over the sea. Now the south wind would fling it to the north wind to be driven on, and now again the east wind would yield it to the west wind to drive. But the daughter of Cadmus, Eno, of the beautiful ankles, saw him, that is, Leucothea, who formerly was a mortal of human speech, but now in the depths of the sea has won a share of honour from the gods. She was touched with pity for Odysseus as he wandered beset with troubles, and she rose up from the waters like a sea mew on the wing, and sat on the stoutly bound raft and spoke, saying, Unhappy man, how is it that Poseidon the earth-shaker has so astoundingly willed your pain, in that he sows for you the seeds of so many evils? Yet certainly he shall not utterly destroy you for all his rage. Instead, do as I say, you seem not to lack understanding. Strip off these garments and leave your raft to be driven by the winds, while you, by swimming with your hands, strive to reach the land of the Phiakians, where it is your fate to escape. Come, take this veil and stretch it beneath your breast. It is immortal and there is no fear that you shall suffer any hurt or perish. But when with your hands you have laid hold of the land, untie it again and throw it into the wine-dark sea far from the land, and yourself turn away. So saying, the goddess gave him the veil, and herself plunged again into the surging sea like a sea mew, and the dark wave hid her. Then the much-enduring noble Odysseus pondered, and deeply shaken he spoke to his own great-hearted spirit. Woe is me! Let it not be that some one of the immortals is again weaving a snare for me, that she bids me leave my raft, 
I shall not in any case obey her yet, for far off was the land my eyes beheld, where she said I was to escape. This is what I shall do, and it seems to me to be the best. As long as the timbers hold firm in their fastenings, so long will I remain here and endure the troubles I have. But when the waves shall have shattered the raft to pieces, I will swim, seeing that there is nothing better to devise. While he pondered thus in mind and heart, Poseidon, the earth-shaker, made to rise up a great wave, dangerous and dismaying, arching over from above, and drove it upon him. And as when a strong wind tosses a heap of straw that is dry, and some it scatters here, some there, just so the waves scattered the timbers of the raft. But Odysseus bestrode one plank, as though he were riding a horse, and stripped off the garments which the beautiful Calypso had given him. Then at once he stretched the veil beneath his breast, and flung himself into the sea with hands outstretched, ready to swim. And the lordly earth-shaker saw him, and shaking his head, thus he spoke to his own heart. So now, after you have suffered many ills, go wandering over the sea until you come among men fostered by Zeus. As the Christian article mentioned, the major similarities is obviously the shipwreck and that the main characters had to go to the island to actually have some sort of help. Now, the major difference between the stories is the fact that the Odyssey is obviously polytheistic in nature in comparison to something like the Book of Acts. Largely because in the story for the case of the Odyssey, it was actually Poseidon that was the one that started everything for the shipwreck, whereas the other kind of story is seem as know that the shipwreck was actually a naturalistic occurrence. So what are the similarities between the island stories for the Book of Acts versus the, um, the Odyssey. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire, and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed, who also honoured us with many honours. And when we departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. And after three months we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. And landing at Syracuse, we tarried there three days. And from thence we fetched a compass and came to Regium. And after one day the south wind blew, and we came the next day to Puteal. Then the goddess, flashing-eyed Athene, had another thought that Odysseus might awake and see the fair-faced maiden who should lead him to the city of the Phaeacians. So then the princess tossed the ball to one of her maids. The maid, indeed, she missed, but threw it into a deep eddy, whereupon they cried aloud, and noble Odysseus awoke and sat up, and thus he pondered in mind and heart. Alas! To the land of what mortals have I now come? Are they cruel and wild and unjust? Or are they kind to strangers and fear the gods in their thoughts? 
there rang in my ears a cry as of maidens, of nymphs who haunt the towering peaks of the mountains, the springs that be the rivers and the grassy meadows. Can it be that I am somewhere near men of human speech? But come, I will myself make trial and see. So saying, the noble Odysseus came forth from beneath the bushes, and with his stout hand he broke from the thick wood a leafy branch, that he might hold it about him and thereby hide his genitals. Forth he came like a mountain-nurtured lion, trusting in his strength, who goes forth beaten with rain and wind, his two eyes blazing in his head. Into the midst of the cattle he goes, or of the sheep, or on the track of the wild deer, and his belly bids him go even into the close-built fold to make an attack upon the flocks. Even so, Odysseus was about to enter the company of the fair-tressed maidens, naked though he was, for need had come upon him. And terrible he seemed to them, all befouled with brine, and they fled in fear, one here, one there, along the jutting sand-spits. Alone the daughter of Alcinous kept her place, for in her heart Athene put courage, and took fear from her limbs. She stood and faced him, and Odysseus pondered whether he should clasp the knees of the fair-faced maiden, and make his prayer, or whether... Standing apart as he was, he should beseech her with winning words, in hope she might show him the way to the city and give him clothes. And as he pondered, it seemed to him better to stand apart and beseech her with winning words, fearing that the maiden's heart might take offence if he should lay hold of her knees. So at once he made a speech both winning and crafty. "'I clasp your knees, my queen. Are you a goddess?' Or are you mortal? If you are a goddess, one of those who hold broad heaven, to Artemis, the daughter of great Zeus, I liken you most nearly in looks and in stature and in form. But if you are one of mortals who dwell upon the earth, thrice blessed then are your father and your honoured mother, and thrice blessed your brothers. Great must be the joy with which their hearts are always warmed because of you, as they see you entering the dance, a flower so fair. But that man in his turn is blessed in heart above all others, who shall prevail with his gifts of wooing, and lead you to his home. For never yet have my eyes looked upon a mortal such as you, whether man or woman, or holds me as I look on you. Now in Delos once I saw such a thing, a young shoot of a palm springing up beside the altar of Apollo. For there, too, I went, and many men followed with me on that journey on which evil woes were to be my portion. In the same way, when I saw that, I marvelled long at heart, for never yet did such a tree spring up from the earth. In like manner, lady, I marvel at you and am amazed, and fear greatly to touch your knees, and hard is the trouble which has come upon me. Yesterday, on the twentieth day, I escaped from the wine-dark sea. During all that time the waves and the swift winds were carrying me from the island of Ogigia, and now fate has cast me ashore here, that here, too, no doubt I may suffer some ill. For not yet, I think, will my troubles cease." but the gods before that will bring many more to pass. Instead, my queen, have pity, for it is to you first that I have come after many grievous toils, and of the others who possess this city and land I know not one. Show me the way to the city, and give me some rag to throw about me, if perhaps you had any wrapping for the clothes when you came here. And for yourself, may the gods grant you all your heart desires, a husband and a home, and may they bestow on you as well oneness of heart in all its excellence. For nothing is greater or better than this, than when a man and a woman keep house together, sharing one heart and mind, a great grief to their foes and a joy to their friends. 
while their own fame is unsurpassed. Then white arm Nausicaa answered him, Stranger, since you seem to be neither a bad man nor without understanding, and it is Zeus himself, the Olympian, that gives happy fortune to men, both to the good and the bad, to each man as he will, so to you it seems he has given this lot, and you must in any case endure it. But now, since you have come to our city and land, you shall not lack clothing, nor anything else of those things which befit a sore-tried suppliant when he appears. I will show you the way to the city, and will tell you the name of the people. The Fiacians possess this city and land, and I am the daughter of great-hearted Alcinous, in whom are vested the power and might of the Fiacians. She spoke, and called to her fair-tressed handmaids, Stop, my maidens, where are you running to at the sight of a man? You do not think, surely, that he is an enemy. There is no mortal man so slippery, nor will there ever be one as to come to the land of the Fiacians bringing hostility, for we are very dear to the immortals. Far off we dwell in the surging sea, the furthermost of men, and no other mortals have dealings with us. On the contrary, this is some unfortunate wanderer that has come here. Him must we now tend, for from Zeus are all strangers and beggars, and a gift, though small, is welcome. Come then, my maidens, give to the stranger food and drink, and bathe him in the river in a spot where there is shelter from the wind. So she spoke, and they halted and called to each other. Then they set Odysseus in a sheltered place, as Nausicaa, the daughter of great-hearted Alcinous, bade, and beside him they put a cloak and tunic for him to wear, and gave him soft olive oil in the flask of gold, and bade him bathe in the streams of the river. Then he went apart, and sat down on the shore of the sea, gleaming with beauty and grace. And the maiden marvelled at him, and spoke to her fair-tressed handmaids, saying, Listen, white-armed maidens, to what I am about to say. Not without the will of all the gods who hold Olympus does this man come among the godlike Fiacians. Before he seemed to me uncouth, but now he is like the gods who hold broad heaven. Would that such a man as he might be called my husband, dwelling here, and that it might please him to remain here. But come, my maidens, give to the stranger food and drink. So she spoke, and they readily listened and obeyed, and set before Odysseus food and drink. Then indeed did the much-enduring noble Odysseus drink and eat ravenously. For long had he been without taste of food. But white arm Nasikaa had another thought. She folded the clothes and put them in the beautiful wagon, and yoked the stout-hoofed mules, and mounted the wagon herself. Then she hailed Odysseus, and spoke, and addressed him. Prepare yourself now, stranger, to go to the city, that I may sit you on the way to the house of my wise father, where I promise you, you shall come to know all the noblest of the Fiacians. But be sure to do as I suggest, and I think you do not lack understanding. So long as we are passing through the country and the tilled fields of men, go along quickly with the handmaids behind the mules and the wagon, and I will lead the way. But when we are about to enter the city, about which runs a high wall, a handsome harbour lies on either side of the city, and the way between is narrow, and curved ships are drawn up along the road, for they all have stations for their ships, each man one for himself. There, too, is their place of assembly around the beautiful temple of Poseidon, marked by huge stones set deep in the earth. Here the men are busied with the tackle of their black ships, with cables and sails, and here they shape the thin oar blades. For the Theachians care not for bow or quiver, but for masts and oars of ships, and for the shapely ships rejoicing in which they cross over the grey sea. You will find a handsome grove of Athene close to the road, a grove of poplar trees. 
in it a spring wells up, and round about is a meadow. There is my father's estate and fruitful vineyard, as far from the city as a man's voice carries when he shouts. Sit down there and wait for a time until we come to the city and reach the house of my father. But when you think that we have reached the house, then go to the city of the Fiakians and ask for the house of my father, great-hearted Alcinous. Easily may it be recognized, and even a child could guide you, a mere infant, for the houses of the Fiakians are in no way built of such a kind as is the palace of the hero Alcinous. But when the house and the court enclose you, pass quickly through the great hall, till you come to my mother, who sits at the hearth in the light of the fire, spinning the purple yarn. A wonder to behold, leaning against a pillar, and her handmaids sit behind her. There, too, leaning against the self-same pillar, is set the throne of my father, whereon he sits and quaffs his wine like an immortal. Pass him by, and throw your arms about my mother's knees, that you may quickly see with rejoicing the day of your return, though you have come from never so far. If in her sight you win favour, then there is hope that you will see your people, and return to your well-built house, and to your native land. So saying, she struck the mules with the shining whip, and they quickly left the streams of the river. Well did they trot, well did they ply their ambling feet, and she drove with care that the maidens and Odysseus might follow on foot, and with judgment did she ply the lash. Then the sun set, and they came to the glorious grove, sacred to Athene. There Odysseus sat himself down, and at once made prayer to the daughter of great Zeus, Hear me, child of Aegis-bearing Zeus, a tritony. Listen now to my prayer, since before this you did not listen when I was wrecked, when the glorious earth-shaker wrecked me. Grant that I may come to the Fiarchians as one to be cherished and pitied. As you guys can see, the inhabitants of both stories seem to be that they're very much welcoming to people like Odysseus, to people like Paul, and they actually help them out when it came down to the idea of running, turning back to their own personal place. And that right there is a very powerful message right there. Largely, because it actually shows people that generosity is actually a good ideal to keep up on a day-to-day -day basis. If somebody was like, you know, lost, you don't necessarily just ignore them. What you do is to make sure that you actually help them out when they're, when they're at their lowest point, right? And so that's kind of the, the takeaway I get from these stories, is that when you have somebody at their most low point, that's when you need to actually help these people out the most. And so that's actually a really good message when it comes down to the ideas and ideals of the both stories for both the Odyssey and for the Acts of Paul. So these are the comparisons that I noticed between the two stories. But uh, what do you guys think about these comparisons? Tell me in the comment section down below. And as always, I'll see you guys in the next video. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I would <laughs> him for Because black friends are rare as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.